Welcome. My name's Taylor. We're so excited that you joined us today, whether you're watching on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or live. Absolutely. Engage with us, connect with us there. You know, you're part of our family. So <laughs> we care about you. We want to hear from you. Today we are jumping into Come Holy Spirit Part 2. Last week was so good, so profound. Um, he talked about the three baptisms. You guys, talk about baptisms. There was a, like 107 baptisms after <laughs> all of our services. So crazy, such revival. Um, no one had really heard uh, the three baptisms spoken in that way, or at least in one service. It was so profound. Like I said, are you ready to go out of the shallow waters into the deep waters and rely on his spirit? I know I am. <laughs> yes. Amen. Huge energy, lots of traffic. Come on, how you guys doing today? Are you ready to worship? Come on, put your hands together. Let's sing. Let's praise our King. Amen.
came to praise today. I came to worship my King and my Savior through everything. I praise cause you sob, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I know I praise cause you cause you reign. today do me a favor man would you scoot in and make room for everyone around you we're gonna have so many people coming in here today and we just want to worship we want to make room for our King for our Lord our Savior he's everything to us amen he's everything so we're gonna worship him with everything we have come on would you sing you do everything on purpose and I can feel your spirit stirring I've been praying, you've been working Working it all for good So fan a flame and keep it burning Right now, Jesus, you're refining in the furnace Oh, and all the waiting will be worth it Cause you're working it all for good Come on, would you sing with us? Sing it Miracle after miracle Open door after open door Here it comes, so get ready for another one Cause another one is on the way after miracle, open door, after open door, here it comes, so get ready for another one, cause another one is on the way.
Focus and set our eyes and our minds on you. We breathe in your sweet presence. Holy Spirit, I breathe you in. I breathe in your sweet presence and it fills me. It fills me with strength. It fills me completely with peace. And right now, that is our prayer. We are open to you, Holy Spirit. Would you come and fill us today? Come on, just invite him, say, Holy Spirit, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. I breathe you in, Holy Spirit. And we invite you. Oh, we invite you. As I breathe you in, I breathe you in. Come fill me, Holy Spirit, with your mind. I breathe you in, I breathe you in. When you come all of a sudden, and I am strong again. 
that right now lift your hands to heaven come fill us holy spirit we breathe you in as we're as we're singing a song and declaring these words you're my mind immediately goes to Acts chapter 2. And the Bible says that all the disciples were together in one house in one place praying. And suddenly, a roaring sound of heaven came and wind filled the room and the spirit fell. And as I was seeing this and reminded of the, the, the breath of God, the wind of God, the spirit, the pneuma, I, I got this vision of, of of, of us in, and, and you, us, in, in like a boat, in a storm, in waves, in, in, and we're paddling, and you're, and you're trying to get through, and you're like trying to make it, but, but it's all your strength, it's all your effort, and you're tired, and I'm speaking to someone right now that's tired. You're tired of, of fighting and trying. And some of you are fighting for your kids and you're fighting for your sanity and you're fighting for your, your marriage and you're fighting and you're fighting. But, 
but it was never God never intended for you to just fight the storm alone that he, he had always intended to be the wind in the sails to, to blow like a rushing wind and propel you through it wouldn't be just by your perseverance and your effort but that the spirit of the living God would move you in and through the season and through the storm will you just receive that right now can I just speak that over your life God I speak right now breath in Jesus name wind in our cells new strength right now coming in jesus name not by might nor by power but by the spirit of god peace right now that surpasses understanding right now in the name of jesus i thank you god that we don't have to figure it out i don't have to have the answers and it doesn't have to get fixed today or tomorrow we breathe right now new breath some of you are out of breath right now and you need to breathe in new breath of god right now in the name of jesus Come, Holy Spirit, and fill us. We make room for you in our hearts. We make room for you in this service. Come and move and change and speak. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise this morning, church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat, you guys, right where you are. And as you are taking a seat, you might see some empty seats uh, around you. Will you, if you got a couple empty seats, will you lift up your hand? Because there's people waiting to be seated and they don't want to sit in the rain. Let us seats over here. Look, because it's hard to see when the, we're all worshiping in the dark. We like to worship in the dark here. I'm just saying. Because I don't, we don't want no one looking at you. You're all, no one can look at me if they, the lights are on. So it's just you and God worship. So raise your hand. I see seats all over this place and up here and up here and up here and over there. So we got some room. Um, if the ushers can, can also help them find a seat in here. Um, I thank you guys so much. I, like we, I know it's, the weather's crazy out there, so we packed even more chairs inside of here, which is an amazing problem to have. It really is. But, uh, but man, it's, it's just been an amazing season. By the way, if you're a guest with us today, there's a bulletin in the seat back pockets right in front of you. Grab that, take that with you, it's yours. It says, welcome home on it. That explains a lot about discovery and who we are and what we do and how you can get connected. There's also a connection card. If you want to write down any prayer requests, we'd love to pray with you. Or if you're, you are a guest, take that because we can give you, we'd love to give you a free gift on the way out at the Welcome Center. Um, we're going to worship God though in our giving right now and our ushers are going to help us do that in just a moment so you can prepare your offering with those tithe envelopes that are right in front of you. I always like to say not to feel obligated to give. Here at Discovery, it is a joy for us to give. We see the difference that God is making through it. So we get excited that we get to contribute to the kingdom of God. But if you are um, a guest, don't feel like you need to do anything at this bar. You don't need to do nothing. If you want to give, give as God leads you to give. But for those of you that are part of Discovery family, you should have got this <clears throat> unstoppable update in your mail here recently. Within the last week or so, if you didn't get this and you actually are part of the unstoppable initiative that we started on our 10 year anniversary, you might want to fill out a connection card and update your address because you should have gotten an update as of March 1st in what God has done and is doing through our Unstoppable initiative. There's been so many people that are new since we started Unstoppable that I just want to take a little moment and explain our Unstoppable vision to um, those of you that may not know what, what this is. We got some pamphlets and stuff out in the lobby that are called Unstoppable. There's even a card in front of you that says Unstoppable in that seat back. If you want to grab that as well, it explains a lot about it. Here's what happened though. Let me give you a, a short synopsis for those of you that are new to Discovery today or have just come in the last few months and you call Discovery home already. When we celebrated our 10 year anniversary in September of last year, um, we cast this vision of what it would look like to be unstoppable. Like in, in our walk with faith, there's so many Christians who just stop. They, they, they eventually sadly stop pursuing God. They stop growing. They stop the hunger and thirsting for righteousness. And we said, what would it look like if we were just a, a, the kind of Christians and people that, that love Jesus that just never stopped? that never stopped growing, that never stopped going, that never stopped. And it's not like, like, you know, God's gonna like tell you to do something he hasn't prepared you to do or like give you, it's just one step. Like what if we just never stop taking the next step and just continue to take that next step? And the reality is there's a lot of people, people that love God and call themselves Christians that draw lines in the sand, that say, all right, God, you're my Lord and stuff, but here's where I just can't go. I can't go any further. 
What would it look like if we were just the kind of disciples that said, no, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna continue, I'm gonna continue to take steps and go further in my relationship with you. And, and then we said, as a church, what would it look like if we lived unstoppable as well? Because as you can see, we're at a place in our growth where there's no more walls to knock down and stuff. And, and we're like, should we stop here? And it was a tension that we wrestled with. And we just decided we are going to be an unstoppable church. We are not going to stop growing and reaching people. So we came up with this unstoppable uh, mission that really is like, it, it is a, we moved all of our, even our finances, it's like one fund now. We don't have like a whole bunch of different things you give towards. We have one fund to give towards because we started, we cast a real big vision. So for our church, like to, what it looked like if we continue to grow in kids ministry and youth ministries and YA and outreach and continue making disciples and discipling even more people. And, and what if we just never stop advancing the church and and then we said in our missions and outreach and what if we never stopped we just didn't get comfortable and complacent but we kept growing and doing more and feeding more and giving more and like let's keep going what would it look like and we cast a vision of more and missions and and then we said what about unstoppable faith man and in our in our expansion of our facilities what would it look like if we just grew a bigger worship center and built more and yeah, and we cast this vision of purchasing land just uh, uh, like right over here. We don't own it, we lease it. But in Jesus' name, we are gonna buy that land. And I actually, there's, there's been some movement already. We've been negotiating for the last several months and I'm, on, I'm not at liberty to tell you yet, but within 30 day, in 30 days, I'm gonna tell you what God has done and how, what's next for us. And we still need the God of miracles to come through, but I'm gonna share with you what God is doing for us to acquire that land and build a new church. And this is the vision we shared in all of us at Discovery. We said, we're just gonna go all in and see what God can do through us to accomplish it. Now, I wanna show you a quick story though. We actually recorded a story of some of our young adults and our, our college students and Discovery College students that when they heard about this unstoppable vision, they're like, what can we do to, and, and cause they're living on top ramen y'all. They're like, what can we do? So. What is God calling us to? And so they actually came together and did something really cool. So check out this video and I'll come right back up. My name is Jaden Reyes and I serve in the Young Adults. I'm actually my prayer captain. And my name is Emily and I also serve with the DY and Y uh, worship team. So my initial thought to Unstoppable was, wow, <laughs> honestly. So I'm thinking, I'm like, um, how am I going to be able to give more? <laughs> so it was honestly like, yeah, just so many different emotions at the same time. Yeah. And I think for me, it was the same thing where um, it was a little bit, you know, like, how are we going to do this? But at the same time, I knew that in every you know, way, every season, the Lord has been faithful um, to provide. So I was just excited, you know. She texted me, it was the weekend after Unstoppable launched and she's just like, um, have a yard sale and like have the proceeds go to Unstoppable. Yeah, this is a phenomenal idea. Really, really powerful when it can seem so simple, but God gets the honor through it all, you know? And so I think it just turned into this, like both again, like a fundraiser, if you will, for, for yeah. Unstoppable, but it also turned into like a fun, like yeah. hang out community. It was also, and I just remember having a moment in the kitchen, we're all like eating after everything's done. And I was like, I'm looking around, I'm like, wow, like we're seriously doing life together. We as young adults may feel like we don't have much or like we don't have things of value, but um, you know, it's like the story of the, the fish and the loaves. You know, you do with it what you will, you know, you multiply it. So I think that that was just kind of like the mindset going into it. As we were wanting to give back, we were blessed. Yeah, yeah. Through the entire process. Through the Unstoppable Yard Sale, together we raised 500 or over $500. Yeah, rather than saying of I can't, or I don't have the capability. Ultimately, I'd say pray, because that's what started this whole thing is telling her like a prayer request I had and look at what happened. So, was, and most of all is just look at God's character because why wouldn't he want to help you in that? Instead of seeing it as just numbers, is seeing the value of what we're putting it towards and knowing that that's your cousin that could be raising their hand in the salvation call. It could be your future child that's in the children's ministry that is just learning about who they are as a child of God and being able to walk in that. So why not be a part of that and do it together? Yeah, why not? Why not? I love that story. I believe together we, we're unstoppable. Like the church together, Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. And so 
Um, I never twist any arms um, when it comes to generosity and giving. I share vision, I challenge you, and then I ask you to ask God and then obey, and that's it. And so we have these, these cards that are in the back of the seat. If you're kind of a guest or, or new, really, not a guest, but I'm sorry, if you're new to Discovery um, and you want to be a part of this together with the church family here at Discovery and accomplish this unstoppable vision, Grab this card. Uh, there's actually a, a big pamphlet out there as well that has a lot more information that we don't have time to go over today. Uh, and these cards are out there as well. But you can fill out this card if you want to be a part of it and whatever that looks like to you to help us reach our unstoppable vision. Amen. Let me pray for your offering. And then we've got a couple of announcements before we get into the Word of God. Lord, we thank you so much because it's a privilege, God, to give to your kingdom. You've provided everything to us. Everything we have comes from you. So we, led by your spirit, give a portion of that to your kingdom to, to invest into eternity. We're not going to eat all the harvest and eat all the seed and, 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 and use it on just these things that are temporal and earthly. God, we're going to store some of it in heaven. So God, I pray that you would bless this offering. Help it to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, you guys, welcome to Discovery Church. As the backs are being passed along the aisles, we have a couple of quick announcements for you guys. The first and foremost, wasn't that story just amazing, you guys? If you have taken a huge step in this uh, unstoppable initiative, we would love to hear your story. It actually says in Matthew, it says in Matthew to share and shine your light so that the world may see and our Father in heaven may be glorified. So if you guys could scan that QR code so we could hear and share your story. Now, Delilah, what else is going on here at Discovery for everyone to hear? Yeah, that's awesome. So we actually have track two happening today in the admin building on, at 115. And track two is an amazing opportunity because we believe that God created each of us to make a difference in the lives of another person and that your life won't truly make sense until you find your purpose, fulfill it, and further develop develop it. So in that class, not only do you get the opportunity to discover how God uniquely created you and your special gifts, but you get plugged into opportunities to use that and serve other people. On, and um, Stephen, it's really incredible that we actually have a leader here. Her name is Katie, and her story is just so beautiful. She moved um, to Bakersfield from Oregon for a job, and she didn't have any community, but she came to Discovery, and she really was in this transition phase of not knowing anybody, but she said, hey, I, I have what I have, and so I'm going to serve and give that. And it's cool because God used that small offering, and he did so much more with her. Her relationship with God um, was deepened, and it actually grew, but he also brought relationships into her life that felt like family and helped make Bakersfield a home away from home for her. So whatever it is that God has gifted you with, this is the opportunity to really discover that because we believe that God created all of us for a purpose and on purpose. So scan the QR code, free lunch and childcare are provided. See, not only is serving super important, you guys, but we always say here at Discovery, we're not a church that has small groups. We're a church of small groups, amen. So we wanna say that small groups are so important and vital to your discipleship journey. But here's the thing, we can't have small groups unless we have small group leaders. So here, uh, next Sunday here at 3 p.m., we have what we call group leader orientation. And this is for you to know, man, how can I serve a group? How can I, how can I be a leader with a small group? No matter how much you know or you don't know about small groups, come join us at 3 p.m. One of our small group leaders, his name is John, he actually felt that call like, man, I, I have more to give. Man, and more to give people here at Discovery. He went to join group leader orientation and he got these men to be discipled. He multiplied himself and he grew a community of Christ following men to grow with another, strengthen each other. He even implemented fitness into his groups, y'all. And how many know we need some help in our fitness journeys? You know what I'm saying? We need some accountability. We need some people with us. So if you guys can scan that QR code for more information, come join us and learn what else God has to offer you through leading a small group. Yeah, and with that, we're going to jump right into week two of the Come Holy Spirit series. Come on. So I, go ahead and get your notes ready, your pen ready, posture your hearts, and turn your attention to the screen.
right, welcome again to Discovery Church. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. You're ready to hear the word. Wherever you're joining us from online or in the lobby, possibly, hopefully you're not outdoor in the rain and we found a seat for you, but we're so glad that you guys are here joining us for part two of a series called Come Holy Spirit. And we wrote the title of this sermon series as like an invitation and a prayer because I'm going to be leading you through week by week to invite the Holy Spirit more and more and deeper and deeper into your life. And this is a topic that can be confusing and can be even like there's some different thoughts about it because we've seen some things and maybe experienced some things and maybe even been weirded out by some things. But the Bible presents uh, oftentimes a very different perspective about the Holy Spirit than some of the stuff that you've experienced. So here's what I'd like to say today and in this series, all that stuff that maybe you've, you have preconceived notions about the Holy Spirit, maybe things that you were weirded out by or turned off by, can you just like throw those out for this series and today and let's just go to the Word of God and let it speak for itself. Amen. We're gonna let the Holy Spirit, like the Word of God reveal to us what the Holy and who the Holy Spirit is. And this is why this is such an important topic. Let me show you this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. Some of you are all familiar with this verse, but it says, but whenever the, anyone turns to the Lord, he says, the veil is taken away, meaning you can see God now. It is revealed. The word is revelation. The veil is taken away. Now there's revelation. Now the Lord is the Spirit. That's who the Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is the Lord. And while the Spirit, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There's freedom. This is the year of freedom. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. And we all, now with unveiled faces, we can see and contemplate the Lord's glory. And because of that, look what it says. We are being transformed into his image. So we are able to look more and more like God, transform into his image with an ever increasing glory. Some translation says from glory to another level of glory which actually comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Meaning this, the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier in your life. He is the one who transforms you to look more and more like Jesus, to take you from one level of glory to another level of glory. As you receive with unveiled, unveiled faces the glory of God, you can be transformed from glory to glory, an ever-increasing glory, meaning it never ends by the Holy Spirit. That is actually a work of the Spirit. Here's why this is so important. Some of you, you're trying to do it yourself and you can't do it yourself. It is a work of the Holy Spirit to be transformed. It's, it's His work. You can't do it without Him. You, so, so you need to um, walk with Him, the Bible says. In Galatians chapter 5, He says, so walk by the Spirit. And if you do that, you will not gratify those deeds of the flesh that keep tripping you up. And here's what some people do. Let me just fix this and concentrate on this and I need to stop doing this and be better over here. No, maybe you shouldn't be focusing so much on what you should not do. If you just give more of you to the Holy Spirit, it actually would take care of that. So, so the answer then is yielding to the Spirit of God, is, is surrendering to and walking in or having a relationship, walking with the Holy Spirit. So here's what I'd like to do today. I'd like us to, to look at what a relationship with the Holy Spirit actually looks like. Uh, you, there, are, there are actually four levels of relationship with the Holy Spirit. So Paul says, says it like this in 2 Corinthians, from glory to glory. You can be at one level, but there's another level of glory in relationship with the Holy Spirit where you are transformed and you are, you have, you are closer to God. So if you love God today, you're a Christian today, you are at one of these levels of glory, one of these levels of relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I kind of want, you, in giving you this, I, I want to hopefully chart a course for you to continue to grow, but also to help you identify where you are at in your relationship to the Holy Spirit. Y'all ready? Okay. Number one is this. The first level is some of you are, you have a foggy relationship with the Holy Spirit. Like, it's just foggy. It's like, I, I kind of, I, I hear about it. I, I mean, I read about it in the Bible. I hear you saying about it, but I really don't know how to have a relationship with a spirit. It's very foggy, very almost mystical to me, and I, and I, and I don't quite get it. And here's what you kind of need to understand about this level of relationship with God. And I know it's bad grammar, but it explains the point. Write it down like this. He is a him. 
I know that's bad grammar, but it makes sense what I'm about to share with you. He is a him. He's not an it. He's not a cosmic mystical force. He is a person. And here's why this is so important. If you don't see him as a person, you will never relate to him personally. If he is just this it or a force, you'll never have a relationship with an it or a force. He is a person to be related to. Personally, the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit as a person, as a him. Again, let's just go to the scriptures. What does Jesus say? John chapter 14, verse 17. Jesus called him the spirit of truth. The world, he says, cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. And that's what we see a lot of today. People are just so confused about him. But Jesus says, you know him for he lives in you and be, and will be with you. Notice the language though here, him, 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 he, he's not a force. He's a person. He's not an it. Sometimes when people talk about the Holy Spirit, they use language of it. He's not an it. He's a person. We refer to him as the person of the Holy Spirit. That is a level though. Some of us have a foggy relationship with the Holy Spirit. The second level of relationship with the Holy Spirit, write it down like this, is where you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you thought that that was the finish line. Like there, there's nothing greater than being filled with the Holy Spirit. No, there actually is. That actually isn't the, be- that's not the ending, it's the beginning. Cause some of you haven't been filled since 1995. Okay, you kind of, you stopped somewhere. You got filled, but there wasn't. So in the scriptures, the disciples in the early church, they didn't just have a one-time experience with God where they were filled. They constantly were refilled with the glory of God in the, pre, in, the, in the spirit of God. I'll show you one occasion. In Acts chapter four, the Bible tells the story of where Peter and John were publicly preaching the gospel. And, and this was in a time where they were still being persecuted for that by the Pharisees. And so they're publicly preaching the gospel and they were actually dragged into this courtroom, the Sanhedrin, which is the, the high priest judges of the time in Jerusalem. And they were, they were dragged into this court. They were threatened not to preach the gospel anymore. They were, they were just threatened. They weren't beat or anything this time. And they were allowed to be released. Well, Peter and John meet back up with the disciples and they started worshiping God and praising God and praying that God was protecting them and providing for them. And they counted a joy to suffer for God. Then this happens in verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled Now, they are already filled, but here they are again. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to shake and bake and roll on the ground. No, that's not what it says. Wait a second. Because that's what some of y'all think when you get filled. That's not what it says. They says they filled the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. That's what happened when they got. So here's this second level of relationship of, of being filled with the Spirit. Here's what some of y'all need to know. He is not weird. Will you write that down? The Holy Spirit is not weird. There are some weird things that happen that get attached to the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is not weird. People are weird. And I promise you, they were weird before the Holy Spirit got to them. Sometimes people do some weird stuff. They act weird. A lot of times people are just, they make it about themselves and they put themselves as like some, to draw attention, like it's all about us, but it doesn't really represent the Holy Spirit. And you got some, maybe some preconceived notions about what the Holy Spirit does and who he is. And there's a lot of bias that doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. It's not what the Bible says, but what people have done. He's not weird. In fact, Jesus says he's actually, he's actually, uh, better for your life than Jesus being with you. Look what he says in John chapter 16 now, verse seven. Jesus talking to his disciples, he says, he's actually talking about his death. And he says, nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth that it's for your benefit. It's for your good that I go away to which they're, they're saying, no, 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 Jesus, you need to stay. You're the one. And he goes, no, I need to go and it's for your good because if I don't go away, the counselor, and we'll come back to that word later in this message, because that's an actual word or a name of the Holy Spirit. The counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. Jesus goes, listen, it's good. And, and you're going to be with him. And a lot of us, what we, we don't think, we think backwards of that today. We think things like, man, if Jesus were here, if I were just to walk with Jesus, how cool would that be? If I could just be with Jesus, in which it would be cool. But here's what Jesus is saying in this verse. This is what Jesus is saying. The Holy Spirit in me is better than Jesus beside me. 
This is a truth, a, a, a truth that Jesus is teaching his disciples that some of us need to get an understanding of. Actually, in this context of John 16, Jesus just finished saying to them, greater things will you do than I have done because I'm actually leaving you. How crazy is that? You know why that is? Because Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. So, so there, is, there is a second level of being filled, but there's so much more, another level of glory that God wants you to have of him and relationship with him. The third level is, write it down, fellowship. That you can actually have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And, and I believe, like I think, in just my observation, pastoring for many years now, I think it's hard for people, and, and they're more comfortable having a relationship with the Father, and they're more comfortable having a relationship with the Son, with Jesus, not as comfortable of having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I think it's because of the name that they've been given. We can associate father and we can associate son. We have brothers and we have sons and it's easy for us to kind of connect with that association. But for many of us, it's hard to connect with a spirit. And how do I have a relationship with a spirit? And I was thinking about this and I was like, God, man, if you really wanted to have people, your, your children have a relationship with your spirit, then you should have gave them a different name. Anyone have any thoughts that like can help God out sometimes? You're like, God, I got a thought. You know, this would have been good if you, if you would have done this. And I was just having some fun thinking about this. Like, God, if you would have just gave them a different name, like, like if you would just name them Bill. If Holy Spirit was named Bill, man, it would be a lot easier. The Father, Son, and Bill, to walk with Bill and talk with Bill and, and, and to have a relationship with Bill. Just, and I started thinking about this. And I was like, this actually works because the more traditional churches would call him William. And then the more radical churches will call him Billy. Do you know what I mean? And so I'm like, this, this, could, this could work, God. And, and the more I thought about it, the Lord said to me, and I'm telling you, it's in my own, like God, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. Speak to me and he said, son, you're thinking about this wrong. The Holy Spirit is his descriptive name. And so, so think about this, because the father has a descriptive, he has descriptive names, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. The son has descriptive names, Prince of Peace and Emmanuel. The Holy Spirit is his descriptive name. He is like a, a deep breath and a mighty wind. That is his descriptive name. And I felt the Holy Spirit. He was so strong when he told me this. Listen to me. He said, I felt the Lord tell me, his name is God. Will you write that down? Like if you want to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you have to understand he is, listen, he is Yahweh. Now, now look at this. So there's Yahweh and the descriptive name Father. It describes his function in your life. There is Yahweh, the Son, which describes his function in our life. And then there's Yahweh, the Holy Spirit, which describes his function inside of our life. He is God. And I can give you a lot of scriptures where the Bible clearly explains when you let the Bible just, just speak for itself that the Holy Spirit is God. But let me just give you one in Acts chapter five. Peter said to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to who? The Holy Spirit. And then the next verse, he says, you have not lied to men, but to who? Yeah, he lied to God because the Holy Spirit is God. And there's this whole persuasion of Christianity that is afraid of this topic, that is afraid of this teaching of the person of the Holy Spirit. You may have even heard things like, man, don't go to that church because they talk about the Holy Spirit there. That's a spirit-filled church over there. You better be careful of that church. Now listen to what they're really saying based on what I just taught you about the Word of God. They're saying this, oh, don't go to that church. They talk about God there. Oh, don't go to that church. They're filled with God there. Are you kidding me? Holy Spirit is God. He is God the Spirit. So, so this is a level of relationship and glory that God wants to have in your life where you would actually have fellowship with God, the Holy Spirit. You could walk with him. But then there's even more. And, and this, is, this is what Jesus was actually trying to do, which I'm trying to do today and in this series to lead you to this fourth level of relationship with the Holy Spirit. And that is Friendship where you can actually be a friend of God. Did you know that? You can be a friend of God. Now, this is another, another descriptor, another, another kind of type of relationship or the function that we have with God, a friend that gets confusing because some people are, are, they think it's like an earthly relationship. And you need to know, God's not your buddy. God's not your hangout pal. He is not. He is a one of a kind God. There is no one like him. And the friendship you have with God is not like any other friend that you will have 
ever, because he's a one-of-a-kind God. Actually, it, the way that God describes friendship with him is very different than the way you, you and I describe being a friend with someone. Okay, again, let's look at the word of God. What does the Bible say about being a friend of God? Remember in John 15, Jesus says, no longer I call you servants. Look what he says in John 15, verse 14. He says this, you are my friends if you do what I command. What an interesting description of a friend. What if I were to go to my friend and be like, Chris, you're my friend, man, because you always do what I say. I'd be a very manipulative person or something like that, right? That's not healthy. But God can say that because he is a -a one-of-a-kind God. And if you want to be a friend of God, okay, anyone who says they're a friend of God, but they're not doing what God says, you're not as close as you think you are to God. In fact, you might not be his friend. You might be his foe. So, so fellowship, write this down. Fellowship creates the relationship with God, but fri- friendship creates obedience. Or obedience creates friendship. Other way around. F- obedience creates friendship with God. So here's what I want to do. And here's what Jesus was trying to do with his disciples in leading them to uh, an awareness of the Holy Spirit in their life. Write this down. Fourth level relationship. He actually wants to be your best friend. That's what you need to know about this level. God, Jesus, he he wants you to be best friends with the Holy Spirit. So as we've talked about these last few weeks, Jesus, toward the last few days of his life, he started talking more and more about the Holy Spirit. So so much more. It's called, um, the theological term is called progressive revelation. We'll talk more about that in the series. Progressive revelation. It means that God is continuously revealing himself to you, building on the glory he's already showed you, giving you more revelation of glory. Progressive revelation. It happened in the Old Testament. It happened in the New Testament. It's still happening in your life, in your life today. So Jesus was giving progressive revelation to the disciples about his Holy Spirit. And in the last day of Jesus' life, he spoke more about the Holy Spirit than in all other days combined. And, I'm, and I'll show you what he said. But, but Paul, he actually says it like this in 2 Corinthians. It's the end, it's his benediction of 2 Corinthians. And he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The amazing grace of the master. Like, I, I want you to know that the grace of Jesus Christ and the extravagant love of God, your father, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit to be with you. He, want, he wants to be your friend. That's his role, to be an intimate friend in your life. And of the three of the Trinity, that is the person that he actually wants you to be closest to. Because listen, the Father is in heaven right now. The Son is seated at the right hand, and the Holy Spirit is with you. Is with you. Okay? So maybe, maybe for a lot of us, maybe we need to stop seeking the power of the Holy Spirit and start seeking the person of the Holy Spirit. Because he's not a force. He's not just for your, for your goosebumps. He's not for your, no, no. He's, he is a person to befriend. What would it look like, hey, if you actually became a friend of God, if you befriended the Holy Spirit? So here's how it happened. Let me just, I, I actually just, I'm going to outline three chapters of the Bible for you. John chapter 14, 15, and 16 is the next, just the next portion of this sermon. John 13, let me give you the context of where we're going. John 13 is, is the, the Thursday before his crucifixion. It's the Last Supper, the Garden of Gethsemane moment. That's all in John chapter 13. But then we have John chapter 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus shares three, John wrote three chapters about what Jesus had to say, and whether it was in in that supper time experience, or in the garden, or on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, sometime between, like before he got taken to be crucified, he said a lot about the Holy Spirit, and John writes about that. And what I did is I just kind of just wrote out what Jesus said. Every time Jesus said, he will, this is what he'll do if you become a friend of the Holy Spirit, I just wrote out an outline based on what God said the Holy Spirit will do in your life and what he will be to you if you actually be a friend of him, his, okay? So that's, that's, that's the rest of it. And then the last one, the sixth one is actually about what he said after he rose from the grave. So this is just what the Bible says. Forget about what you thought it was. Forget about the preconceived notions and things you were exposed to or experienced. Will you just ditch that for a moment and let's just go to the word of God and what this actually says and how Jesus is trying to lead us towards friendship with the Holy Spirit. Because this, what, this is what's going to happen. Jesus says, if you become a friend of the Holy Spirit, number one, he will be with you. That's, that's what will happen. I know that seems simple, but let me kind of explain this to you. What does that mean that he'll actually, the Holy Spirit will be with me? Well, let's look what Jesus said. 
And then let me explain it. John chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor, there's that word again, to be with you forever. So, so he will never leave you nor forsake you. God will not. What God? The Holy Spirit. Now, the counselor is another kind of one of those Greek words that's hard to translate. In your Bible, depending on which translation you have, it might say advocate, helper, comforter, counselor, and all those are great definitions of what that word is because it's a very complex word. Because within the word, it means like advocate. Yeah, because there's like, it was used in a lawyer sense where you have an advocate, someone defending you and standing up for you. There is the sense of helper, because that's what the word also means to come. And then there's the, the comfort, to bring comfort, counsel, free counseling. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen, somebody? All right. The word in Greek is parakletos, and it literally means to walk alongside. That's what it means to walk alongside. And in literature, here's what it was used, like in other literature, parakletos, in Greek literature. When one person would pick up one end of a long log, parakletos would pick up the other end and walk with you. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants to pick up the, the other end, help you carry it, and walk together. He wants to be with you. Doesn't that sound good? He just wants to be with you. He wants to advocate for you. He wants to help you. Anyone need some help in here? He wants that counsel. Anyone need some free counseling? <laughs> he wants to comfort you. And I was studying this word parakletos and its, and its depth and beauty. And I got to this word comfort and as a comforter. And I, was, and I thought about when I first got married to, to Veronica. And I mean, we, got, we had like hardly any furniture, you guys. And we, got, we took the beds and the, and, and the pillows and everything from our own houses with our parents. And just that's what we're using. And I, can't, I remember the day when Veronica came home and was like, honey, are you okay if I buy a comforter? And I'm like, what's a comforter? What's a comforter? You know, I don't know what a comforter is. And she explains it to me. And I'm like, that sounds cool. That's a big, you know, for a, heavy, a heavy blanket. It's what that big blanket. And I'm like, yeah, a big blanket sounds cool. And so I'm thinking Walmart $49.95 was not no $49. I come, I come into the bedroom after she buys it. And it's, it's, it looks so comfy, big old new pillows and stuff on it too. And, and, and I'm like, this looks good. I can't wait to lay in this tonight. Now, Day goes, evening comes, I go into the room, and the comforter is gone. And you ladies are laughing right now because you know what happened to it, and every guy in the room is like, where'd it go? Because we don't know. We don't know. I didn't know. Because I'm like, that's what I said. Where'd it go? Where'd this thing? I've been looking forward to getting this thing. And she goes, honey, that's not for, that's for looks, not for use. And I come to find out there was a lot more things that she would buy that would be for looks that I can't use. There'd be pillows I could not put my head on, you guys. I had to move out the way. There was towels and that would be hanging places that I cannot touch. And I did not know this. I remember the first time I grabbed the towel on the rack because I didn't bring a towel. And I'm like, that's a towel. And I'll grab that one. And I, I get out of the shower and my wife says, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> Apparently something wrong. I don't know. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, I don't know what I'm doing, but... I, can't, I thought about this, though, that that phrase, it's for looks, not for use. Check this out. Listen to me. Uh, and I wondered how many of us have a comforter in our life that's for looks and not for use. I wonder how many of us like the way he looks, like the way he sounds in your doxology, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you like the way it sounds and the way it reads, but he has no function in your life, no use in your life. Like you're not as close to him as he desires to be. And I'm telling you, this is, the, this is what he wants, what, he, what the Holy Spirit wants. If you be his friend, he wants to be with you. He wants to help you, advocate for you, comfort you, and counsel you. He wants to come alongside you. That's what Jesus says. Here's the second thing. If you befriend the Holy Spirit, he will, check this out, he's going to reveal the word of God to you, like the Bible to you. This is one of his roles, did you know that? To actually reveal truth through the word of God. The word is revelation. He'll bring revelation. Have you ever had that happen where you're reading the Bible and you read a scripture and you've read it before, but one time you read it and something pops out to you? Like the lights come on in that thing. That's actually the work of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, when the lights come on in that verse, the moment that happens, the power has now been given to you to accomplish what it says. So you cannot actually accomplish what the word says without the spirit in the word. Some of y'all need to catch this. Listen, the power of the word of God is because the spirit that's in the word. 
So it's not Father, Son, and Holy Bible. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the Word of God, we honor. It is, it's God's Word. But let you, people can read the Word of God and not get the revelation of God. They can read the Word of God and not catch the power of God. Jesus actually told the Pharisees, you err because you think you know the Scriptures. You know God. But the Scriptures were actually to point you to me. And some people reveal, they read the scriptures and it gets, they're missing it. They're missing it. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that brings revelation to the word of God. So, so this is, this is what Jesus said. John chapter 14, again, let's, we're just looking at what Jesus said. Get rid of what you think. This is what Jesus said. But the counselor of the Holy Spirit, the father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you everything that I've said. So he's the one who brings the word of God to mind when you need it. He's the one who reminds you and brings it to the surface where you're in a conversation or a situation and the word of God comes to you. You're praying and then the word of God just comes to you. Which by the way, you gotta put it in there first for him to remind you of it. So you need to know your word and get in your word and for him to actually remind you of that word. But this is a, a, what the Holy Spirit will do in your life. If you actually go from glory to glory, more and more he's going to reveal revelation, revelation. He's going to continue to remove the veil, give more revelation to you. How many of you want more revelation in your life? This is what happens when you go from glory to glory, become a friend of God. Number three, Jesus says, if you befriend him, he's going to help you share Jesus with others. This, I would actually say that this is the primary function of the Holy Spirit in your life. The main purpose of the Holy Spirit is to empower his disciples to accomplish the mission that God has given us. And the mission wasn't for us to have feel-good services. It was to preach the gospel to all nations. Because heaven and hell are a reality, and, and the Holy Spirit cares about that. He cares deeply about that. John 15, 26, here's what Jesus says. When the counselor comes, the one who I'll send from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, here's what he'll do. He will testify about me. That's what he's going to do. He's going to show people me. He's going to bring revelation to me. So when you're sharing about what God did in your life and what Jesus did in your life, and you're sharing your story, the person, how the lights come on in that person that you're witnessing to is the Holy Spirit. He's going to actually empower your words and bring light to people. He's going to reveal Jesus to them. That's the function of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and it is the primary function. I got a core conviction about this because there is a lot of people make it about a lot of other things. They make, the, they make something else the main thing when this is actually the main thing. They make other things the main thing about the Holy Spirit. And I'll just call it out. They make tongues the main thing about the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, and we'll talk about this, by the way, in this series, I'm going to explain to you about the gift of tongues and the baptism and tongues. And we'll do it on the day of Pentecost in about several weeks. On the day of Pentecost, I'm going to talk to you about Pentecost and tongues. We're going to go there and I'm going to share with you, again, just what the Bible says. Forget about what you thought, just what the Bible says. But a lot of people make that the main thing and it's not the main thing. That is a work of the enemy, I believe, to divide God's church and to keep you from the main thing, which is reaching the lost and making disciples. This is the main purpose of the Holy Spirit in your life. When the Holy Spirit fell on Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit moves. People get saved. That's what happens. If, if you got a Holy Spirit time in the Holy Spirit and moving on, if you actually want more of the Holy Spirit, but your heart doesn't break for the loss, then you ain't getting no more of him. God, I want more of you. God, give me the Holy Spirit. Fill me, fill me, fill me. But if your heart doesn't break from the loss, I'm sorry, you're missing the heart of God and you ain't getting more. Acts chapter one, verse eight. But you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will fall out all over the place. Nah, it doesn't say that. You'll be my witness. That's what happens. You're gonna be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's what happens. You're gonna, you're gonna be filled with a witness. Power to be a witness. Why? That's his main function. You know, we've, that's what happens when the Holy Spirit shows up. We've already had here at Discovery people that filled out a connection card that said, I gave my life to Christ. 1,425 people already this year gave their life to Christ. Come on, give God some praise for that. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit shows up. Here's the fourth thing the Holy Spirit will do. He will convict me of sin. That's a function of the Holy Spirit. When you get closer to him, he's going to bring more conviction in your life. And some of you are like turned off by that word. And, and y'all, listen, God is not preoccupied with your sin. Some of you think like he's like got a magnifying glass. No, no, no. God's not preoccupied by your sin. You know why? Because he's already dealt with your sin. It's on the cross. That's it. He's not preoccupied with your sin. When you hear conviction of sin, some of you feel bad for that. 
That is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. The enemy condemns you. The enemy, when you do something wrong, he wants to bring condemnation in your life. Like you, 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 you said something, you did something, you clicked on something, he wants to condemn you for that. That's not the Holy Spirit. When you say it and you do it, the Holy Spirit doesn't go, dang it, why'd you do that? No, no, he, he, goes, he goes, hey, that wasn't for you. Here's how you get out of that. Here's what conviction means. Conviction means to point to the way of life. That's what conviction means. He wants to redirect your lives to something better. John chapter 16, verse 8. When, the, when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness in judgment. So he's going to show you a better way. How many of you don't want that, man? To, to, like when you, when you misstep, you know, the Holy Spirit will be like, hey, don't go there. Don't do it. Don't say it. And then you say it. And he'll be like, dang it. Okay, here's how you get out of that. That's, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's helping you get out of the situation you got yourself into. He will convict you, and you need the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because sin and Satan is deceptive. They are deceptive. Satan is a liar, a deceiver. He doesn't come. Say, the Bible says Satan comes disguising as an angel of light. So he, he's not going to come at you and tell you how he's going to destroy your life. He's not going to be like, this is how I'm going to destroy your marriage. Here's my three-point plan and how I'm going to take your kids. And here, here's how I'm going to, this isn't, that's not how he does it. He comes, the Bible says, as something attractive and good that you think is good in your life. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, you're going to take the bait. You need a witness in your spirit to check you. Isaiah 30 says it like this. You'll, whenever you turn to the right or the left, your ears are going to hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Hey, not that way. This is the way. Walk in here. Okay, this is the, the fifth role of the Holy Spirit. Write it down like this. He will guide me through life. That's what he'll do. That's, if I befriend him, he's going to actually guide. What an amazing attribute of the Holy Spirit to be a guide in my life. A voice behind you saying, here it is. Walk in it. Let's see what Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 13 again. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So he's not going to, he's going to expose falsehood. He said, that's deception. That's false. That's error. Here's truth. Well, he will not speak his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you, look what it says, what is yet to come. How many of you like that? that? That before it even comes around the corner, you got a witness in your spirit about it. Now, he's not talking about fortune telling. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, when you got a decision to make, do I take this job? Or this job? Do I take the promotion? Is she the right one? Do I propose to him? Is it time to have kids? Is, is this the city? Is this the church? When you got a decision, he'll put a witness or a peace inside of you. He'll tell you, hey, hey, this is the way. Walk over here. That's the Holy Spirit's function in your life. He'll guide you through life. I mean, how many of us would not want the guidance? Through? And the more that you, like, the more you walk with him and listen, the more you're going to discern his voice when he speaks, because you're going to make some missteps, but then you're going to learn from it. You're going to go, oh, I remember when he was trying to tell me about that last time, and I dated him anyway. So I feel like, you know, here we are again, and I feel like there, oh, I can hear the voice a little bit, a little bit clearer now. I know what that sounds like, right? Okay, so he wants to guide you. Here's the sixth thing. Jesus says, if you befriend the Holy Spirit, he'll continue to fill you. Not just one time, not just one time, but he'll continue to fill you. Now, that's what he'll do. When the Holy Spirit will fill you with power. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 5, 18, don't get drunk with wine because that'll just ruin your life. It's a whole other message in and of itself. But, but here's what he's saying. He's like, we're always looking for like comfort, help, you know, something to console us. But you don't need that. That's going to destroy your life. Instead, be filled with the comforter, the helper, the counselor, the breath of God, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is not a suggestion. This is a command of the Bible. And when you look at this word, be filled, it actually is in like a present tense participle, meaning it, the, the, the implication is continue to be filled, continuously be filled with the Holy Spirit. You gotta continuously be filled. So when you befriend him and you're walking with him, he's gonna continue to fill you and continue to fill you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, that's why the Apostle Paul who wrote this book, he writes it to Timothy and he says this, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God because the fire can easily go out. You get busy, you get distracted, you're doing things and that fire dwindles and dwindles and you need to fan the flame. You need to get a refilling. You need to come to God again, which is in you, he said, through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us. Now, so Timothy, God, 
He imparted the spirit to you when we laid our hands on you. But that spirit that he gave you doesn't make us timid or afraid. But here's why you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because he gives us power, love, and self-control. Power, love, and self-control. So why do we need to continuously be filled with the Holy Spirit? Let me give you these three things that Paul says, why we need to continuously be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then we're gonna continue to look at this next week. But there's three things, and then I'm gonna pray for you. Paul says you need to continuously be filled with the Holy Spirit to live a supernatural life. Will you write that down? Because you need power. It was never the intention of God for you to live as his child, as his son, as his daughter, by your own strength, but to live supernaturally by his breath, by his gifts, by his guidance, by his help. It's all from him. It's all by him. Supernatural power. I'll talk to you more about that as this series continues. But that's why you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The second reason, Paul said, is so that you can live on mission. You can, because that's the spirit, that's what he gives you. He gives you love, and God is love. And here's how Jesus, Jesus said, they'll know you by your love. This is how they'll know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. And so if you want to live more effective on mission, you got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because one of the things that, that dissipates, the first thing to dissipate when, you, when your fire starts going out, and you're getting further from God, you know what, it's this right here, your patience with people, your tolerance with people, your love for people. You start getting offended easy. You start getting irritated easy. You start cutting people off. Yeah, yeah. So we need to be filled with the Spirit so we can live on mission and live lives of love. And then the third thing he says is, is to self-control. He, he gives us self-control to live right down like this, to live righteously. Now see, some of you think that, again, I got to fix this. I need more self-control. I need more self-discipline. No, you need more of God. Let me say it like this. Don't try to conquer that sin in your life, listen to me, let the Holy Spirit conquer you and it'll take care of that. I just, if I just yielded more to the Spirit, I'll, the outcome of it will be, you know, self-control is a fruit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Meaning the more I am walking with God and the more I have given myself to Him and yielded myself to the Spirit, the fruit will be self-control. It's not about me working harder, trying harder. I'm not saying you're not going to have to work hard or try hard, and that's not part of it. What I am saying is it's not, that's not the reason. The reason is because you've yielded to the Spirit. You've been filled with the Spirit. I don't know what you thought it was, you guys, but the Holy Spirit isn't a force. He's a person. He is God. He will be with you. He wants to develop a relationship with you. He'll come alongside you, guide you, bring revelation to you, taking you from glory to glory. Come on, can I pray that for you wherever you're at? Will you bow your heads right now? I want to pray that over every person. Will you whisper this right there with me every week? We're going to do this. Will you invite him? Come, Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, Holy Spirit. I invite you. I need you. Come walk alongside me. Come pick up the other end and help me, guide me, comfort me. Will you show me the way to walk in it, God? Will you fill me with power, for a supernatural, righteous life. Transform me, Holy Spirit, from glory to glory. May I see new freedom in my life as I yield to you, Holy Spirit. Come and fill me. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today, and in your first step really to this transforming life is to surrender control to Jesus today. Now, it's not by your effort that you can actually attain the life that God wants you to attain. It's the work of the Spirit. And the Bible says, if you just confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe it in your heart, you shall be saved. It's a work of belief and of faith. And if today is the day, some of you for the very first time are ready to put your faith in Him and surrender your life, I'd love to help you make that decision. And some of you others need to make it again. Wherever you're at today, even if you're online, here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna count to three. And at the count of three, I want you to lift up your hand wherever you are, type in the chat, I need Jesus, if today's that day. And I'll pray with you right where you are. Come on, one, two, three, right now, lift that up. Today, I need Jesus. I surrender control. All over this place, really high. All over, yes, 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 yes. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. Come on, all over. Yes, yes, yes. I need you, God, and I surrender. I'm not going to try to do it myself anymore because I can't change me. Only you can. Holy Spirit, change me. Oh, thank you, God. Will you put your hands down all over this place? Now, let me help you with a prayer. You say it right where you are. Mean it from your heart, though. I'll help you with the word. Say, say it like this. Jesus, 
forgive me for my sins. Today, I surrender my life, and I make you my Lord. Now, come live inside of me and change me. Help me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that word today. Amen. Hey, Jess, as you were seated, come on, there were so many people who gave their life to Christ. Let's let them know that was an amazing decision, the best decision of their life. Come on. Bunch of people. Here's, here's what I want you to do. If you did do that, if you gave your life to Christ, it's not the end. It's the beginning. Fill out the connection card. There's a spot on the card that says, today I gave my life to Christ. Check that off. Take it to the Welcome Center, and I got a gift just for you, okay? Make sure you get it. And if you're a guest, make sure you grab your gift as well, all right? Don't forget, track two is today at 115 in that admin building. We'd love to see you there. We got prayer partners up here. We'd love to pray for you. We love you. God bless you guys. Go love God, find freedom, love each other, and change the world.
Okay. 